Let's begin this morning with our verses of scripture. I hope that you uh, took advantage of Ephesians chapter 4. We'll be looking at first. Had the, uh, the scripture on the uh, screen a few minutes ago to give you a head start. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 4. We'll be looking at 1 through 1 through 7 and verse 11. And the Bible tells us this. So I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And we'll skip down to verse 11. It says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Um, let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning as we go into the time of looking into your word, hearing a message from you. We pray, God, you'll speak into our hearts, into our deepest need, conviction, motivation, whatever that might be. Give us the, the, the willingness to hear and accept your word and the boldness to carry it out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to show you a couple of those verses again with something particularly highlighted. Ephesians chapter 4, 1, Therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy. Highlighted is the vocation wherewith you are called. Notice that vocation is, uh, is your job. All right? 4, 4 said, uh, There is one body and one spirit as you are called in the hope of your calling. Do you believe that each one of us has a calling a job, an assignment from God for our lives. Let me ask you this. How much did your salvation cost you? In the manner of speaking that you had to earn it, nothing, right? Nothing. It was absolutely free. Nothing was required to get it, and nothing is required to keep it. So does that make it okay to receive the gift of salvation and then do nothing in return? No, we would say no. All of us would shake our heads and say, no, of course not. It is not okay to do nothing, to, to do nothing which will testify of our thankfulness for what God has done for us. We have the ability, we have the, the, the ability to refuse to do anything that God wants us to do, right? We have the ability to do that. And he will still love us. He still extends forgiveness to us. He even still blesses us although maybe not to the degree of blessing that we would receive for obedience, I think it's probably safe to say that everyone, everyone has felt God's call to do things. Everyone that knows Christ as their Savior, that is, has felt God's call to do something, maybe many things, maybe big, maybe small. And probably we all understand that everyone has a calling of some sort, <clears throat> But many Christians are either ignoring it or refusing it or frustrated because they don't know what their ultimate calling is yet. And that is where the basis of the message is this morning. I've been preaching through the basics of faith, right? We've been going through that. And this week, we'll, there's going to be a transition into a series kind of focusing on, on Moses for a few weeks. Um, the subject this week should be a good segue for that as we look at the, the calling of Moses and compare it to the calling or vocation that God has for each of us. So speaking of Moses, I, and that will we'll be in uh, Exodus chapter 3 in just a, just a minute if you want to go ahead and get ahead and start that way. I'm sure everybody knows the basics of Moses' story, right? He was born a Hebrew, raised as an Egyptian. He ran away, he returned to leave the Israelites out of bondage to the promised land. We've all heard Moses' story. He is spoken of as the deliverer of Israel. 
He performed miracles. He spoke directly with God. Moses is the one he brought down the Ten Commandments when God gave them to him. Twice, because he broke them one time. Right? He brought down the plans for the tabernacle. Moses is considered one of the most important figures in the Old Testament, in all of Judaism. If you ask them probably who is their, their most important figures, there would be a Father Abraham and Moses right there neck and neck. What we don't always hear about Moses was that in the beginning, he didn't want the job. But it was his job. He didn't feel qualified, and he was right. But you can finish this statement with me. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. How many times have we heard that? Let's read together the occasion where God called Moses uh, out for the job that he had in store. In Exodus chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 10. God, this is uh, probably pretty familiar scripture to everybody, but, uh, but let's, let's get it fresh on our mind by seeing this amazing picture of what happened when God called Moses out. Chapter 3, 1 through 10 says, Now now Moses kept the flock of Jethro's father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and beheld, and, and the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight while the bush is not burnt. I bet he did. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. He said, here I am. He said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from thy feet. For the place whereupon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, the large, and, uh, uh, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Pezzarites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I've also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, here's the where he really boils it down. You know, I've seen this whole situation. Now here's what I want you to do. He says, come now therefore and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And then uh, look at verse 18. He gives it, there's another direction over there. He says, uh, and, and thou shalt hearken unto thy voice. Uh, they shall hearken unto thy voice and sh thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel unto the king of Egypt and ye shall say unto him the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us now let us go we beseech thee three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God he said Moses you're going to go to Pharaoh and tell him we're going out of here you recognize that, of course, as the, uh, the the burning bush incident. You heard that from Sunday school ever since you was a youngster, probably. Um, you know, if we didn't know already about the trepidation that Moses felt about, about doing this, uh, we might think, judging from what we now know that Moses became, the, just the, the awesome figure of God that he, that he went on to be, we might think that after God told him what to do in the burning bush, uh, he jumped up at the opportunity to ride back into Egypt and to march into Pharaoh's castle and demand that the, the Lord says, let my people go. But in reality, Moses immediately doubted if he was the man for the job. Look at verse 11 there in the scriptures that we just read. Uh, he said, he said, 
You say, get in the right chapter, Brother David. Moses said unto God, who am I that I should go into Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, who am I to do this? With that question, who am I, Moses is basically telling God, I don't feel qualified to do that. And he was right. He wasn't qualified to do that. We'll talk about some of the reasons why he wasn't. And he gives those reasons to God here in just a minute. But let me ask you this. Have you ever tried to do something that you thought was the right thing to do, but it turned out it was the wrong thing to do and it blew up all in your face? <laughs> Most of us have been there, right? Now, this was kind of the situation that, that Moses finds himself in here uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, why he didn't feel like he was qualified to do this before. Uh, you, you know, to, to go back and go to Pharaoh and be the deliverer of the people of Israel. Um, but imagine being told by God that you're going you're gonna to go do an even bigger version of what you messed up the first time. All right, look at this. Here in Exodus, go back to chapter 2 with me, verses 11 through 14. Now, we know the history of Moses, and we'll look at it a little deeper into it in just a minute, you know, how he was raised up by the Egyptians and, and then, then um, turned back to his people of Israel. But look at chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Watch what he did. It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. He looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when, uh, when, it, when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together, and he said uh, to them, well, uh, he said to him that did wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killed us the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. See what happened in that instance there was Moses saw one of his people in trouble. So he stepped in to deliver his fellow Hebrew from this one Egyptian. He was, he was a deliverer in a small sense. Then it blew up on him. But somebody saw and the word got out. And then the Egyptians warned him for murder. And the Hebrews didn't even appreciate what he had done. What happened? It seemed like a noble thing to do, but that wasn't God's plan. Well, actually, it was God's plan because he used this to get Moses out of the picture for a while until the time was right. But Moses, what he had done was stepped out on his own. He took matters into his own hands. He committed murder. Who was he to be the one to go back to Pharaoh who wanted him dead and to a people who didn't want him at all? why he felt like he wasn't qualified to do the job. That wasn't the only question of God's judgment that Moses had. He has three more to go. Look in chapter 3, verse 13. And, uh, and Moses said unto God, uh, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? We'll read God's answer to that in just a minute. I'm reading into this a little bit, but it sounds to me like Moses is saying here, God, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know what to tell them your name is. How do I, how do I get this going? There's a, uh, there's a young man that I'm real proud of that was uh, telling me just a while back that he feels led to work with young people. And he said, uh, he said practically this exact same thing. He said, uh, he said I, don't, I don't know where to start. Look, I'll just say this. If you feel led and you don't know where to start, keep looking. Don't give up. Keep looking. God is getting you ready. And he will open a door when the time is right. And be moving in the direction that you need to go. Start small. I know of some great big ministries that started with a couple of people in living rooms. Start small, keep your eyes open, watch for the doors open. But look at Moses' next concern. Chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me. 
nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord has not appeared unto thee. How many times has this been said to think? Those people won't listen to me. They know me. Or, or this one. Those people won't listen to me. They don't even know me. You see how we can make that excuse work either way. The devil wants you to believe that nobody will believe that God sent you and that nobody will take you seriously. It's exactly what he wants you to believe. And you can prove him right simply by not trying. If you do nothing, nobody even has a chance to believe you or maybe to believe that in the God that sent you. Then he comes up with this one. He keeps going. Right? And this is a doozy. It's a legitimate concern. Or, or at least it felt like it was to him. Look at chapter 4, verse 10. Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither therefore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. It becomes clearer a few verses later that Moses wasn't so worried about speaking clearly to Pharaoh, but he had to go back and convince the Hebrews that God sent him to be their leader. That would take, in his mind, some smooth talking. What did Moses fail to consider there, though? The spiritual aspect. The spiritual aspect that God was able to prepare his people to accept Moses when he came. It wasn't Moses who would do the convincing. It was God who would do the convincing. So often, we let things from the physical world become a stumbling block for us when God has the answer worked all, already out in the spiritual realm. But it's hard to see past those physical things. Now God, of course, has an answer to every one of Moses' worries. All right? But before we look at those answers, we'll get around to them in just a minute. I want us to see that it was, it was truly a work of God that Moses was even available to be called. Because he should have been dead. Now, I met a man one time a long time ago. I always remember this when I think of somebody that shouldn't be here. And I don't, I don't, I don't know the guy's name. I was at a place getting some parts for a truck or something. And this fellow just kind of ambled up, started talking to me, you know. And uh, and he, as he was talking, he felt the need to show me. He said, you know what, I've been stabbed. I don't remember what it was, like five or seven times. And he picked up his shirt. I mean, it was like when you see on, on a TV show when people got bullet scars. It was clearly stab marks in his chest, in his belly. And he was telling me about that, and then, uh, I told him, I said, man, I said, I don't know what it is, but God is saving you for something, and you better figure out what it is and get home task. You know, and I didn't get to share very much more with him than that, but I've always thought that when, if you can look back, and probably most of us can, and see things that probably should have took us out of this world, but didn't, then I figure God's got something in store that he has for us to do. Now, usually the first Moses story that we hear as children is the one about how his mother put him in a little basket, floated him out into the river, and he was found by Pharaoh's daughter, right? Now, we know from chapter 1 that the reason that, that she had to do that was because Pharaoh, uh, the Pharaoh that was friends with Joseph, that brought him there way back, uh, that took in Jacob and his whole family, which became Israel, uh, he was long since dead. All right? And the people of Israel kept on multiplying. So out of fear that they would turn on him, the, the next Pharaoh made them slaves. Now, I didn't research this, but in the course of, of the 400 years that they were there in slavery, I would imagine that there was a few successions of Pharaohs, and, and while conditions kept getting worse, for the Israelites, God kept blessing them, and they kept on multiplying. And there was more and more and more. Now their numbers were getting so great that the government said, I mean, the Pharaoh said, catch that. I have to do something to keep these people from growing. I got to do something to hold this back. So he told the midwives, you can go back and read this in the scriptures there, he told the midwives, that the, the baby deliverers, that they should kill all the baby boys that were born to the Israelites. But they feared God more than Pharaoh, so they didn't do it. And God blessed them. 
But Pharaoh was not a man to give up easily, so he did this. Look at chapter 1, verse 22. It says, Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Now we see the bond that Amram and Jacob had, the parents of Moses, were in. See, everyone who was an Egyptian was ordered to kill their boy child. There was no sneaking and hiding. If he was found, he would be cast into the river. So Jacob had no choice but to put him in the river herself. Of course, she didn't throw him in. She did something to give him at least a chance of survival, and she made him that little boot. Look at uh, chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. So when she could not, she could not longer hide him, she took him uh, for she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags, that, that means the reeds, by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to wit what it would be done to him. And the, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Just a footnote there. How many you think she knew it was one of the Hebrews' children? Well, number one, it was, it was in the river. And number two, after eight days, they circumcised their boys. He had the mark of God already on him. Now, it doesn't say this in the scriptures, but I, I would be willing to bet that it was no coincidence that she put baby Moses where she did. I don't think she just picked a random spot and put him in the, in the river. Uh, it was, something tells me that, that she knew the area where Pharaoh's daughter bathed and put him there hoping that she would find him and have pity on him. Of course she did. And doesn't this just have God written all over it? The whole situation. God had him placed in the right place. God caused the princess to fall in love with the, with the little baby Moses. Uh, enough to pay Jochebed to nurse him until he was old enough to live with her and be raised as her son. Don't you just get a kick out of when you see God take something that was meant for evil and make it work out for good? We see it in the scriptures, we see it in our life, and it always makes us smile. Casting babies in the river was supposed to be the end of the Israelites. But putting this baby in the river saved him and saved the whole nation of Israel. Later on, just a, just a few verses in scripture, but 40 years in time passes in just a few verses. Moses kills the Egyptian taskmaster. We read that just a minute ago. And then this happens. Look at chapter 2. Verse 15, uh, the first part of it says, uh, Now when Pharaoh heard this thing about Moses killing the Egyptian, he sought to slay Moses. Moses had escaped Pharaoh's hand as a baby, only to face it again as an adult. And he would have been well known to Pharaoh. Probably also to the royal guards, and everybody knew the guy that had been raised by Pharaoh and had now turned on him by killing a fellow Egyptian. He was in serious danger. But God provided a route of escape. Look at 15, the second part. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. So now here he is, alone, strange land, no home, no job. He can't go back. The Egyptians want to kill him. The Hebrews don't trust him. How's he going to live? What's he going to do? Have you ever been there? You ever been there when it feels like everything has gone wrong? What can you do? Just trust God. Just trust God. God has a plan. In Moses' case, and you can read this, I'll, I'll just tell you, it's a modest, for, for Tom's sake, some ladies showed up at the well where Moses was hanging out. They were in trouble. Moses helped him. Later, he married one of them and spent 40 happy years tending sheep for his father-in-law, who, by the way, was a priest. We don't know what kind of a priest, but it seems to be a, a good man. Later on in the book, he, re, he meets Moses at Mount Sinai and praises God with him. So maybe he was a priest of the true God. There was no Jewish priest yet. That comes on down the line a little ways. But so God provided a place for him. I wonder, 
I wonder though what Moses thought as he spent 40 years there in Midian. His heart was with his people. But he didn't have a directive from God to go back there yet. So what did he do? He maintained where God placed him until the new mission came. There may be laws where we don't have a big job to do for God, but the mission is coming. Be ready to see your burning bush. Be ready to move when Jesus says. But in the meantime, maintain, grow, learn, pray, witness, serve. There's always something to do. Now Moses was there all the way into chapter four. Uh, he's, uh, he's still into the burning bush bush uh, as we read through that uh, uh, he's expressing his concerns to God we're, we're backing up here a little bit because I want to point out that God was not angry at, at Moses for expressing his concerns all right but we read those concerns that, that Moses brought out a minute ago God knows we have concerns if you have questions and concerns take them to God he has answers let's see what he told Moses we have to back up because uh you know, God answers them question by question here. So number one, what was the first thing he said? Moses said, who am I? Who am I? Which, which meant I'm not qualified to do this. Here's God's answer. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 12. And God told him, he said, uh, he says, certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. <laughs> God said, God said, you don't have to be qualified because I'm going with you. When you take on a task directed by God, you run on his authority. Right? He's all the qualification that we need. And to top it off, he assured Moses, he said, this is going to work. And when y'all get out, you'll be right here serving me again. The burning bush that he was standing at talking to God. Well, where was that at? That was Mount Horeb which is also called Mount Sinai, which is where God will later give Moses the Ten Commandments and all this stuff. He gave him a preview. He said, you're going to make it out and, and you're going to be here again worshiping me right here on this mountain. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if we knew how our story ends? If we, if we already knew, would we be bolder to step out and do things for God if we knew what our result was going to be? Like, like, will we go to heaven one day and gather around the throne of God and cast down the crowns that we get as rewards for doing the mission that he gives us to do? Wait, we do know that, don't we? God's already told us now it's going to work out. We're going to be there worshiping him when it's all said and done. Yeah, he doesn't give us all the details we want about what's going to happen in the meantime. That's where faith comes in. Second concern Moses said well, was, was where to start. I don't even know where to start. Moses said, I don't even know what your name is to tell them who sent me. Chapter 3, verse 14. God said unto Moses, I am that I am. That's my God, my God voice. I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. He said, Here's my name, Moses. Start with that. I am is a great name for God. It's I am, not I was, not I will be. I am is present. Wherever, whatever time, I am is there. It's important that we are clear that when we're doing something, we're doing it in the name of God. And Brother Bud was talking about the name of Jesus this morning. He had no idea that I was going there in the, in the sermon this morning. Uh, but, but doing things in the name of God makes it clear to others that we're doing it for God and reminds us that we're not doing things for our own gain or out of our own effort. We do it in his power. And there's power in that name. We claim the name of Jesus. We call ourselves Christian, right? At the name of Jesus, barriers fall. At the name of Jesus, hearts are changed. At the name of Jesus, demons tremble. One day, even those who refuse to believe will bow to the power and authority of that name. Look at this. Philippians 2 says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him 
and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. It's a powerful name. Moses was then concerned nobody was going to believe him. Get on. Chapter 4, verses 2 through 5. The Lord said unto him, uh, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and became a serpent. And Moses fled from before him. The Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it and became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. Miss Layla was reading this to the little ones in Awana a few weekends ago. She's been talking about Moses to them in there. And, uh, and she was telling them that very instant there. And there was various opinions in the room about what one would do if our staff turned into a snake. I don't think pick it up by the tail was at the top of anybody's list of ideas. All right. You can read on and see that God gave him a few other examples of you know, miraculous things. What he did was he gave Moses a way to show them that God was in what he was saying. Now, we're not going to get that ability, at least not that way. Most of us would not want to pick up a stick that turns into a snake anyway, would we? But we do have some helps. We have the complete written word of God that uses our proof text. And we have the Holy Spirit of God empowering us and touching the hearts of those that we are ministering to. He has already given us all that we need. And finally, there was the issue of the speech impediment or whatever Moses was describing as a slow tongue there. And look what God gives him for that. Four, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. It says, And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will, I will be with thy mouth, and will teach thee what thou shalt say. You know, everyone has things that try to hold us back. Everyone has things that that we can see in our life, those stumbling blocks that try to get in the way of what God wants us to do. And it, that reminds me of someone in the New Testament, also Brother Bud, I thought he was going to preach my sermon on this this morning too. It's somebody that had a similar issue, 2 Corinthians, Paul said this, at, at, le at least I should be exalted, uh, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Uh, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, our God, who never makes mistakes, is able to equip us to do what he has called us to do. Whatever we see as holding us back, his grace covers that. Whatever, whatever shortfall in our relationship, if God's calling, he already took care of it. Whatever physical infirmity we have, speech impediment, I, I've never, never met a, a preacher who said I was, uh, I've always felt really, really comfortable uh, doing this kind of where you know. I never felt one, well, let me say it this way. I've never spoke to a preacher who said, uh, I thought I was going to be a preacher. I didn't feel qualified. I was too. Most everybody of us, for whatever God is calling us to do, big or small, the devil's going to put things there that says, you can't do this. You're not qualified. Now, remember I said a minute ago that, that God was not mad at Moses for expressing his concerns. He's about to get mad over what Moses says next. In chapter 4, verse 13. <clears throat> and he said, Moses said this, O oh my Lord, sin thou pray thee by the hand of whom thou wilt sin. Now it's hard to understand what Moses is saying there from, from 
from this translation. Let me clarify. He said, Lord, please send somebody else. That's what Moses was getting at there. Please send somebody else. The only part of the conversation that angered the Lord was when Moses tried to back out of the assignment. Look what, what God responded to him. Verse 14 said, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Of course, the Lord went on and even gave him a way out of that. He said, look, he said, well, I'll just read the rest of that verse here, 14. Uh, and he said, is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. He shall, and thou shalt speak unto him. And I'll put the words, and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. God already had that whole plan now. When Moses said, oh, God, I don't want to do this. Send somebody else. And Moses was angry. I mean, God was angry with him, but God already had a plan. He knew that Moses was going to react that way. But he already had a plan. He said, look, Aaron's coming with you. He's a good speaker. You tell him what to say. He can tell the Hebrews what to say. And all this is going to work. Look, i got to wrap this thing up. Musicians should be making their way to the front to lead us on a verse of invitation this morning. I want to look back real quick to where we started. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. In verse 11, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers, some musicians and some um, witnesses and some to do whatever you can think of. Some missionaries. I just want to say to you, if you're currently in your calling for this present time and working on it, keep up the good work. If you're in between and you don't know what you're calling, the next calling will be to maintain, learn, grow, and watch. If you know what your calling is and you're running from it, stop that. It's not a safe place to be. God still loves you. His grace still covers you. But I wouldn't want to spend a minute with the Lord's anger kindled against me either. Of course, all of this is moot. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You've got to know Christ as your personal Savior. It's the most important decision ever. None of this matters because you're lost and bound for hell without him. He paid the price for our sins on the cross of Calvary and offers that hand of forgiveness right now. Let's stand together. A business to do with God this morning. The altar's open to pray. Speak to me about something. If I can show you the way to salvation or anything else. Let's sing together now. 290.